Your last name. Who was not here last night? Oh my god, that's right. <laughs> what? No. Who was not here? Alright, so I'll do a quick little intro out here. It's supposed to be five minutes and we're already running late. So. Alright, so welcome to night two of this group called Fire Talks. Okay, don't get this microphone. Yeah, um, go ahead and get closer now. I'll come work on it. Okay. Uh, my name's Rex. Um, I basically work for a large DoD contractor during the day, and at night I run a small website called NovaInfosec.com that's dedicated to news, information, and resources for security professionals in uh, Northern Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. So there's my little plug. Um, so, you know, first what fire talks are, they're basically you have your 30-minute presentations and you also have your 60-minute presentations and we basically, uh, so fire, fire talks are just in an alternative format, so they're 15 minutes. Um, the whole theory is that a lot of presentations go like Mr. Jason Streets. No. <laughs> I'm going to use you as an that example. That was so yeah. funny the first time. <laughs> Um, I use his as an example last week. But basically what I found at a lot of security cons is like somebody's going to release this cool tool and you basically, you listen to them, like all this background stuff and then the last five minutes is, oh, this is cool, you know, this is where all the cool stuff is. So, you know, 15 minute format is, is to force the speakers to just, com uh, you know, compress a lot of the background down and just get to the good stuff or the meat of their content. Uh, Jeff is both the best talks. Um, like I said, Friday, this is Saturday night. Um, this is a little picture of what it looked in 2009, which was the first year that it started. Uh, Michael Santarangelo, which I still can't pronounce. Mubix and several others started it as part of the Podcasters Meetup meet effort, if anyone remembers that. Um, it was basically held at the end of a hallway. Um, Jack Daniel, I don't know if he's here this evening, he did this <coughs> inaugural sock puppet presentation, if anyone remembers that. Uh, so then, um, you know, 2010, that was Snowmageddon, so we had a lot of issues, but in the end, everything worked out. 2011, 2012 worked great, had lots of fun. Uh, now we're up to 2013. Um, so I just want to give a big shout out to a lot of the people that helped out and helped us bring together. So Jack Daniels, Sarah Clark, Jason Oliver, and Nat Gitt, who helped with uh, go through all the talks that were submitted. Um, recording, as always, is Ivy over to the left. All right. <laughs> uh, Alice helped timing last night. Unfortunately, she won't evening and then also security, right? We have our security team in place, right? Yes. Okay, everybody wants. I guess not. I never took that. It's on the stage. It'll be anarchy. Yeah, all right. So Sarah Clark, Dr. Pina, and Jason Oliver. Jason, are you, are you here? Okay. I guess I'm doing security. <laughs> Uh, so this is the schedule for this evening. Uh, Zach is just going to give a, an awesome talk on drones and how we can use that in a, as an attack tool. We have Damien who's going to talk about trying to hack into managed service providers and then from that basically you know, everybody. We have Chris Campbell who's going to talk about how we can do some awesome stuff with PowerShell. John Willis is going to go into and discuss gaps that are in the 20 critical security controls. Bill Gardner, aka Onse, where is he? He's way over there. All right, he's gonna, we're gonna get back into the, the we're gonna be using the C word and the A word, but I don't wanna say that yet, so. Um, and then also, Travis Goodspeed is gonna finish up with an awesome talk on um, thumb drive and, and using that for active disk forensics. Uh, but that's basically it, and we're going to move on to the first speaker. <coughs> Zach.
just a few seconds. So just bear with us. We got very uh, the very first of this, we're going to go very quickly, then we'll slow back down a little bit, uh, just uh, as we have time. Uh, about me, I am an airline pilot. I do drones. I do all kinds of stuff. I do bit testing. And a lot of this came from just kind of mixing things that I do to get together. Uh, this all started off as a DARPA project for a competition. That's where I got started with drones several, several years ago. Uh, we ended up with a team that, uh, unfortunately, uh, the whole competition kind of fell apart a little bit, got messed up. So uh, after it got expanded over a couple of months, it kind of fell apart. So we were named on the faculty of the competition. But I started looking at drones across the world. Of course, uh, 76 countries are working drones, all kinds of sizes, models, um, categories, if you wish. Um, if you guys want to look at these slides later, you can. Uh, but this is really just kind of background information. Talk about the different altitudes, the different things that are out, are out there, like the uh, U.S. Air Force's uh, actual shuttle uh, that they've been using. That's actually got more time in flight uh, in our space than all the space shuttles combined. That basically learned about in the last year or so. As far as legal things, uh, I'm not your mother, so or your father, or anybody else. Pretty much. Uh, until the FAA gets off their butt and decides what they're going to do with a lot of drone technology inside the United States, you can't use it for any commercial operations, and <laughs> you really just can't do much with drones right now as far as uh, a legal means of doing things. Uh, you have to deal with the FAA, you have to deal with the FCC. Uh, our drones we use right now are currently used for five different frequencies as far as 900, 1.3, 2.4, 5.8, and some others. So, uh, Depending on what you're trying to do, the range you're trying to get, makes a huge difference. Uh, so first we'll talk about designing a drone. Uh, everything we we'll talk about is mostly the off-the-shelf stuff. We can get you guys into a drone, that depending on what you want it, uh, for literally a few hundred dollars. So you can get started. Uh, the stuff I use is the stuff I'm familiar with, so that's the stuff I'm going to talk about. But there is lots of different units you can get, there's a lot of different frameworks you can operate with. I use the uh, Arduino Pilot, or Arduino Copter uh, set, just because that's the ones that I've become familiar with over time. That's the ones I've used to actually uh, run the code stuff for. <coughs> so the best thing about this is you can really just start if you're going to get started with uh, off-the-shelf RC airplanes. The stuff now is the foam, is the EPO foam, so it's basically just like the same uh, foam airplanes you get at the toy store. The only difference is they throw a little bit of uh, epoxy in there, and it makes it almost indestructible. We've had drones hit light poles at 120 miles an hour on the floor. You can literally pick it up, uh, kind of just work out some of the rough edges, throw it back up in the air, and it's good to go again. So it's a nice thing compared to the Pink Blue RC airplanes you know, a few years back, where you built all that thing out of balsa wood, you covered it with all that crap, and you flew it for about 15 feet, and it smashed the ground, and it was gone. Now you don't have to worry about that as much. You can actually just keep flying and stupid things over and over again. Um, I will say the multi rotors. I am newer in this field as far as doing this. I have several friends that are really good at it. I have another guy I work with that's really good at this. I am absolutely horrible at these things. I just basically cut off all the kids' hands and feet trying to operate them. So, uh, and that's what I was going to bring here. Unfortunately, it turns out carbon fiber 11 inch blade coming through TSA is not the best thing for us. So, between that and lithium polymer batteries, I wasn't getting anything up here really. So, unless I shipped it, I'm good. So, talk about some of the designs, uh, especially when you're looking at the quadcopters, it takes a lot to be able to keep it uh, flying. Uh, so, to keep from hand flying, basically, you know, control every machine separately, which is really good to do. They make all these uh, stabilization controllers. These are the ones that you can actually get without autopilot systems. So, if you wanted to, you could actually get some of these stabilization controllers, and you can interface them right into the Raspberry Pis. Uh, and fly them that way, you can fly them with our DMs. You can do all kinds of stuff to actually interact between this and the, uh, or to make your own, roll your own autopilot system if you want. Um, the good thing, the bad thing, the way that the world works, uh, you can get stuff extremely cheap in China, it turns out. You guys are not aware of that. So, like this radio right here is uh, one that most people, or not most people, a lot of people use, uh, that is the <coughs> ER9X. Has the Open9x firmware that you can also get. Uh, a good radio in the states for nine channel radios is roughly six hundred, eight hundred dollars. You can get these from China for forty five bucks. Uh, and what you get is uh, this radio right here, which is a decent unit. And then the firmware is really where it's lacking. But the good news is you can either make your own, uh, or else they actually have some Pogo port, uh, Pogo port adapters, I guess you would say, that you put on there. 
that allows you to flash the firmware on these that flash on the fly. So then you can actually do all kinds of stuff, including changing out the main board, which you see in the bottom right, and uh, upgrading it to different architectures so that you can actually get this up to 32 channels instead of the typical 8 or 9 channels. The Arduino Pilot, which is what I currently use in uh, my drones, just because, like I said, it's what I'm used to, it's what I've learned. Uh, the older version on the left, the one on the right is the newer version, you can see how much they've shrunk it down. It is a full INU, meaning it has accelerometers, it has uh, barometric pressure, so it's it pretty much just like an autopilot in the regular aircraft, you can determine the state of the airplane, it can do wind correction, it can do routes and courses and plotting, uh, so that you can uh, do advanced flights with it. Um, and then to help with the range, they make tons of stuff out there for the uplink. You can uh, use the telemetry now through, uh, I usually mostly use the Zigbee uh, interface. Uh, sometimes I'll throw a Raspberry Pi or another a smaller piece of board on there and actually encode video and everything and then just send it down through like 2.4. Uh, but they do actually make uh, cheap and tank trackers now uh, for trying to do the most distance you can. You can get about 900 megahertz if you're really good and pump it up almost 30 miles at this point, so you have quite a bit of range. Depending on what you're flying, uh, I will say that the uh, smaller quads, hex copters, uh, have a battery life pretty short. I'm sitting around 15 to 20 minute flight time, where we do have some of the uh, airplane more modes, the single engine pusher motor, that we can do, <coughs> it depends on what you're doing, but you can get up to three hours on those. So if you really want to time the target, then you have to do something that's more of an airplane Obviously, harder to get up off the ground and back on the ground. You have to have a little surface to lay and take off. But as far as uh, time on target, it's really what you're looking for. So here's the mission planner. This is the one that the guys uh, developed to go with the Arduino Pilot. Really good program, as you can see. Uh, it pretty much follows the interface of flying most of the drones, where you actually have the GPS. Or, I'm sorry, the uh, Google Maps in the bottom right. If you have video in your drone, you can actually overlay it with a heads-up display, which is in the bottom left. And then uh, you can actually look at stuff like altimeter heading, airspeed up the top, and you can actually set in courses and change it in real time. So as long as you have a telemetry up and you can communicate with it, you can actually have the autopilot fully fly itself and uh, just sit there and change the mission parameters. So like I used to do, if I was trying to go to a flight or a location that I was going to do testing in, I could actually map it to, it took off from my house, circled overhead a couple of times, followed down the road to where I was going to, circled overhead about three times, and it would come in and land in a field about the time I pulled up in there. Uh, all fully autonomously, pre-programmed before I left the house. Pretty simple stuff. This is all open source, straight out of the box, nothing special. This is literally $300, $400 to get you out the door, doing something pretty simplistic like that. Uh, which sounds, you know, Simplistic, uh, as far as as much uh, times you have to put into it. Uh, this stuff is pretty much plug and play at this point. They've made a great system that does pretty much everything for you. Another one, uh, Q Ground Controls, another group that has a pretty good product that uh, is really nice because you can run this in different platforms, uh, including tablets. And this one, believe it or not, can run 256 drones at one time. So if you had a great little army if you wanted to unleash, this would be a great software for you because it can actually uh, task them all the different things. And then you can do things like if I want to be time on target, let's say I want to have eyes on target 24 7, it can monitor and say, okay, when this battery gets to 20%, we're going to launch the next drone. The drone's going there, it establishes time on target, establishes on target, then that one returns and goes back for uh, recharging or refueling. And so it can sit there and continuously do that for you uh, to make sure that you have uh, eyes on target at all times. So that kind of brings us down to the stuff we really want to talk about, the capabilities of the drones. Uh, this kind of started whenever I started messing around with a target that was kind of behind uh, a secure area. That's as far as secure, having a really good perimeter defense, a uh, pretty good guard station, and we're like, well, how could we, if we want to do a physical attack, if a facility that has multiple buildings, really get it so that we can learn it. And you do have things like Google Maps, which is great because you got satellite imagery, depending on how long that go that picture was taken. But if we want to see something that is really current, like is that shrub there still for us to hide behind? If we want to put a pivot there, is that ladder there? Is that ladder down on the fire escape? Then we need to figure out how to do that in real time. So uh, that's where we start talking about extending the capabilities of the drone to be able to do some of these advanced uh, 
thing. Um, target acquisition and tracking, just a big shout out to the open source community. We think of open source, we think about tons of tools that people make now that we use for pit testing and all that great stuff. But still, in other aspects, people develop stuff like, uh, and this is a video that I uh, wish we had time to see, but uh, it's a system of uh, learning a target for every angle. So it's a tracking system that as this aircraft flies around or as the angle changes, so if you have an aircraft drone over a target and you need to learn a target, let's say you're watching a particular area and you see a guy in a backpack and a hat and you need to follow that guy around. Uh, the software is really good, this is full open source, and what it does is as the aircraft comes around that target, it learns it from all sides. So it knows what that guy looks to right, like from 360 degrees. And it'll actually follow, and let's say the guy has the ability to get reacquired as it comes out. Well, let's say he takes his hat off to try to change his appearance. It can actually, you can set the number of factors to involve, so if it says, well, I think that's the thing, 80% of me knows that that's the same target I was following. The only thing missing is the 20% from the top where the hat is. You can say, well, you got an envelope where you can reacquire that target. So as the guy comes back out, let's say, hey, here's 80%, this is him, and you can reacquire. Uh, Go. And again, the cool thing, the guys on the left that you can't see, uh, or you can see, the two objects on the left is pretty much how to build your own GPS tracker. Uh, it, a 9 volt battery can run for several days, which is really nice. So what that is, is uh, the bottom is a ZP radio, and the top part is a uh, GPS unit. Uh, now you can get GPS units that are about the size of a quarter. There's 64 channels, so you pretty much have from a cold boot to a GPS lock within pretty much two seconds. Uh, so you could actually attach this to uh, a vehicle, a person, whatever you want to find and track uh, and hide it really pretty easily and uh, the drone can actually continuously receive the latitude longitude from that target and will keep its uh, eyes on it at all times. The drone software automatically has uh, yaw and roll control for cameras. So if you say that I need a latitude longitude and I need eyes on it, then it will actually uh, modify its flight plan and control the uh, the camera servo so that you have uh, eyes on target at all times. So it's really nice if you really want to stalk the air level shit out of the Not a problem. So this kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier, physical pin testing, and how we're going to get a, a, a very good description of the area or a 3D description of the area. So it turns out that who in here has used Microsoft PhotoSynth? Anybody? Yeah, so actually a few people have used it. They actually have an app on the phone. And what it is basically is, is a, a service that Microsoft runs where you take a whole bunch of pictures and it kind of figures out a way to interweave the pictures together to make a 3D uh, picture of an object. Which is nice for places like Statue of Liberty and everybody goes and takes pictures of it and everybody dumps their pictures into the photo um, And it renders a pretty decent 3D picture. Well it turns out you can actually take that 3D picture and you can export it out into uh, AutoCAD. And you can throw stuff out in 3D printers and stuff if you want, which is really awesome. So you want to do a physical assessment of the place and want to know what's there. You actually send a drone over it. The drone, um, you can either do it with mapping. It has a mapping system in it now, where it'll actually automatically do your whole racetrack back and forth every so many feet, depending on what kind of camera system you have. Or else you can just tell it to do circles overhead and take that video feed, break it down into frames, and send it over to PhotoSynth. And you get stuff like this right here, where you get all the pictures at the top left, you jump it into PhotoSynth. You get a 3D tracing in the bottom left, and you actually export that out to uh, AutoCAD. And now you have your full 3D representation of your facility that you want to uh, check out before you go in. So you can actually see, well, was that shrub still there? What's the distance between the shrub and the building? Three minutes? All right, we're going fast. So you can actually see what's the different distance between the shrub and the building, and if you have clearance to hide stuff uh, in there, which is extremely handy. Raspberry Pi, like I talked about, it's great for the filament on there because it's lightweight. Uh, you can do video encoding on that, send it back down. You can interact with it as far as you could run the entire system through it as far as flight controls and uh, video feed and everything. And then uh, use that link over, say, Wi Fi uh, to be able to control everything through one frequency without having to hop through several of them. Mike and Rich, you guys know those at all? They started out with that, that good guy. Uh, more of it. They started out with doing wireless access points, uh, like war flying, what they called it, uh, monitoring uh, different access points. We've done a few of the same things where you've actually taken directional antennas and built them into the thumb of the wings so they don't absorb too much. So you can actually do pretty good uh, mapping, overlay with 3D mapping. There's one for uh, 
neighborhood and just north of my house that pretty much every access point is mapped. Uh, the whole is, I have the whole uh, neighborhood in 3D. And then you can actually throw in GSM on top of that. So I don't know if you guys know, USRP on the top left, you can build into it pretty easily. Or else you can get a fin to sell if you guys know how to hack those and do GSM. Uh, cell phone intercepting, uh, man in middle techniques, and then you can actually do tracking. Uh, which is great because it gives you lots of experience to do on your uh, target tracking and acquisition. You can do it based off cell phones, it's uh, a pretty fun little trick to do. First person view would be the last thing. Uh, if you guys get a chance, Google those guys. Uh, legality wise, what they do for the industry is probably not the best, but talk about beautiful videos. These guys uh, do first person videos where they fly through uh, basically city streets and uh, beautiful landscapes around the world. and. Uh, Put it all on YouTube for everybody to watch, which is uh, very interesting to say at least they do a great job. So, since we're out of time, I went through it real quick. If you guys have time, or if you guys want to, you can catch me on IRC on Freedom or on Twitter. Uh, catch me after this. I'll be around probably tomorrow in the labs mostly until uh, I have tomorrow about four or so. Um, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, we're good.
di questo momento.